Nick Dwyer back for the 10th inning with another episode of This Day in Sports History. In yesterday's episode, we saw Doc Ellis throw the famous LSD no-hitter. We don't have anything as crazy or spectacular as the LSD no-hitter today, but there are still numerous things that we have to get into today. Before we do though, if you all enjoy this video, leave a like on it. If you're new to the channel, you like what you see, you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Now let's get into it. This day in sports history. We start out today at the 1890 U.S. National Championship for Tennis. On the women's side, Ellen Roosevelt defeated defending champion Bertha Townsend 6-2, 6-2. This would be Roosevelt's only major title of her career on the single side. Now we go to the British Open of 1895 and 1896. In 1895, J.H. Taylor retained his title that he won in 1894, defeating runner-up Sandy Hurd by four shots. This would be the second of five Open Championships for Taylor. Then at the 96 Open, Harry Varden won his first of six Open titles, the first of seven majors in his career, four strokes ahead of defending champion J.H. Taylor in a 36-hole playoff. Now we move into the 20th century. In 1905 Major League Baseball, Christy Mathewson, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, threw his second career no-hitter while the Giants defeated the Cubs 1-0. I bet Mathewson was a little upset that he did not get the perfect game in this game because it wasn't his fault why it wasn't a perfect game. 9 innings pitched, 0 walks, 2 strikeouts. The team, though, had 2 errors, ruining Mathewson's chance for a perfect game. Three years later, we go to boxing in 1908, and Tommy Burns knocked out Bill Squires in, in eight rounds for the heavyweight boxing title. Four years later in 1912, we go right back to Major League Baseball. We go right back to Christy Mathewson. Mathewson notched his 300th career victory in a 3-2 win for the Giants. Mathewson would become the ninth pitcher to accomplish this feat, and he would be the first since Cy Young in 1901 to get his 300th victory. Now we move up to the U.S. National Championships in 1914 and 1915 in tennis for the women. In 1914, Mary Brown won her third consecutive U.S. title and her last major, defeating Marie Wagner 6-2, 1-6, 6-1 in three sets. Then in 1915, Mola Mallory defeated Hazel Hotchkiss Whitman 4-6, 6-2, 6-0 in three sets. This would be the first of four straight U.S. single titles and the first of eight majors overall on the single side for Mallory. 20 years later in 1935 and we're back to boxing, James Braddock defeated Match Bayer in 15 rounds via unanimous decision to win the heavyweight boxing title. This would be the first defense for Bayer and he would end up losing it. Braddock got the unanimous decision. 12 years later in 1947, the first night game at Fenway Park occurred and the Red Sox ended up defeating the White Sox 5-3. For the Red Sox, David Ferris got the win, and Boston scored all five of their runs in the fifth inning. Ted Williams had two RBIs on the day. Sam Melle had another RBI. The other two runs were unearned for the Red Sox. However, it didn't matter. They got the win 5-3. One year later in 1948, Babe Ruth, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, had his final farewell at Yankee Stadium. There were thousands and thousands of fans in attendance for Ruth's final speech at Yankee Stadium. Later that year, Ruth would pass away in August, truly making this the final time. Now we go to the U.S. Open on the men's side for 1953. Ben Hogan with a score of 5 under. Ben Hogan with a score of 5 under for a record time 4th U.S. Open title was 6 strokes ahead of runner-up Sam Snead. Not only was this Hogan's 4th U.S. title, but also the 8th of 9 major championships in his career. Three years later, we go to 1956 and we hit the first European Cup final, which saw Real Madrid defeat Stade de Reims 4-3. Reims got off to an early lead with Mikel LeBlanc scoring in the 6th minute and then Jean Temelin scoring in the 10th minute. Real would come right back though, tying it up with an Alfredo Di Stefani goal in the 14th minute and then a Hector Real goal in the 30th minute, 2-2. After halftime, Real would end up taking the lead with a Mikel Hidalgo goal in the 62nd minute. Reim, though, wouldn't stay quiet. Marquitos ended up scoring five minutes later in the 67th minute, getting it 3-3. With only 11 minutes remaining in the game, Real got the game-winning goal when Hector Real scored in the 79th minute, giving him two goals on the day, giving Real Madrid the first inaugural European Cup victory. 
Now we move up to 1964 and we have a world record. Basil Heatley ran a world record marathon in 2 hours, 13 minutes and 55 seconds. This would be broken less than 4 months later, but as I say for all world records, it's a world record nonetheless. Now we move up to the 1965 LPGA Western Open which saw Susie Maxwell with a score of 2 under win 3 strokes ahead of runner up Marlene Hagg. This would be Maxwell's only Western Championship and the first of 4 major championships in her career. 6 years later we stick with LPGA, not at the Western Open though, we go to the LPGA Championship which saw Kathy Whitworth with a score of 4 under win 4 strokes ahead of Kathy Ahern. This would be Whitworth's second of three PGA championships, and the fifth of six overall majors in her career. Five years later in 1976, we stay with the LPGA once again, this time at the Canadian Open. Donna Capone would end up winning in a playoff hole with Judy Rankin, giving her her only Canadian Open victory. At the same time that was happening, we go to France at the French Open on the women's final. We have Sue Barker claiming her only major singles title, defeating Renata Tomanova 6-2, 0-6, 6-2 in three sets. Now we go right back to the LPGA Championship in 1982. We saw Jan Stevenson with a score of 9 under win two strokes ahead of runner-up Joanne Carner. Now we go to the NBA Finals in 1989, which saw the Detroit Pistons going up against the Los Angeles Lakers. The Pistons would end up sweeping the Lakers in four games, and in game four, the Pistons would win 105-97. For the series, Joe Dumars averaged 27 points, Isaiah Thomas 21, Vinny Johnson 17 points for the Pistons. For the Lakers, James Worthy with 25 and a half, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar 12 and a half. Wasn't enough though as the Pistons were just able to sweep. In the Game 4 loss, James Worthy scored 40 of the 97 points. Now we go right back to the LPGA Championship in 1993. Patty Sheehan with a score of 9 under won her fourth major title, one stroke ahead of runner-up, Laurie Merton. This would be Sheehan's third LPGA championship. Two years later at the NHL Eastern Conference Finals, the New Jersey Devils defeated the Philadelphia Flyers 4-2. In Game 6, they would also win 4-2, qualifying for their first Stanley Cup Finals in their franchise. In the Game 6 victory, the Devils were up 2-1 after one period, 3-1 after two, and they would end up both scoring a goal in the third period, with a final score of 4-2 to move on to their first NHL Finals, which they would end up winning. Now we go back to the NBA Finals in 1997, which saw the Chicago Bulls defeat the Utah Jazz four games to two. In the series, Michael Jordan averaged 32 points and Scottie Pippen averaged 20 points. For the Jazz, Carl Malone, 24 points, 10 rebounds. John Stockton, 15 points for the series. Game six was all Chicago though. Michael Jordan, 39 points. Scottie Pippen, 23 in the 90-86 victory. Malone and Stockton did everything they could for the Jazz in that game. Michael Jordan though, too much with those 39 points. Now we go to the 2002 Stanley Cup Finals which saw the Detroit Red Wings defeat the Carolina Hurricanes 4-1 and 3-1 in the Game 5 victory. This would be the Red Wings' 10th title and for the Red Wings, Brendan Shanahan scored two goals in the victory, one of them being an empty netter with 45 seconds to go in the game securing the victory 3-1. One year later in Major League Baseball, Roger Clemens got his 300th career victory and 4,000th career strikeout. Clemens on the day, 6 and 2 thirds, 10 strikeouts, and Clemens would become the first player since 1990 to get his 300th victory. And he would be joined by a couple players after this in the 300 win club, but not many. Clemens also became the third player part of the 4,000 strikeout club, Randy Johnson would eventually join, but there are only four members of that exclusive club. Now we go to the 2004 LPGA Championship, the 50th edition of it, and we saw Anika Sorenstam with a score of 17 under win back-to-back -back championships. This would be the 7th of 10 major championships for Sorenstam. Now we have perfection in 2012 when the San Francisco Giants pitcher Matt came through the first perfect game in the Giants franchise history. The Giants ended up defeating the Houston Astros on the day. Matt Cain, 9 innings pitched, 14 strikeouts. More importantly, no walks. The team had no errors for him. As Matt Cain went down in history, became one of the 23 pitchers to throw a perfect game. Two years later, the 2014 Stanley Cup Final, the Los Angeles Kings defeated the New York Rangers 4-1 in the series, 3-2 in double overtime in Game 5. This would be the second championship in the Kings franchise history. 
for the Kings, Justin Williams scored in the first period, Chris Kreider, Brian Boyle scored for the Rangers in the second, making it a 2-1 to one game. In the third though, Martin Gabaric scored for the Kings, and then in double overtime, Alec Martinez, 14 minutes and 43 seconds into the overtime, got the game winning goal and the series winning goal for the Kings, giving them their second Stanley Cup. Now we move to 2015, Alex Rodriguez surpasses 2,000 RBIs after a two-run home run off of Baltimore Orioles' Bud Norris. Alex Rodriguez, kind of like Roger Clemens in the 4,000 strikeout club, would become the fourth member of the 2,000 RBI club. Then we go to 2018, and FIFA Congress votes to award the 2026 World Cup to the joint bid by the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Finally, in 2019, at the NBA Finals, the Toronto Raptors defeated the defending champions, Golden State Warriors. The Raptors ended up winning Game 6, 114-110. This would also be the last game at Oracle Arena for the Warriors before moving into a new arena. For the series, Kawhi Leonard won MVP, scoring 28.5 points, averaging 10 rebounds. Pascal Siakam, 19.8 points. Kyle Lowry, 16.2. For the Warriors, without Kevin Durant, he was injured. Stephen Curry scored 30.5 points. Clay Thompson, 26. In Game 6, though, Kyle Lowry and Pascal Siakam both scored 26 points. And Fred Van Fleet off the bench and Kawhi Leonard, both with 22 points. For the Warriors... Clay Thompson with 30 points before the injury, Andre Iguodala 22, Stephen Curry with 21, and Draymond Green with a triple-double. It wasn't enough though, this was the Raptors year. It helped that they were playing a little bit of an injured Warriors team, but it doesn't matter. Kawhi Leonard went lights out that series, he ended up getting series MVP, and he ended up leading the Toronto Raptors to their first NBA championship in franchise history. So there you have it, that's what happened on this day in sports history. If I left anything out, let me know down in the comment section. If I mispronounced any names, I do apologize. Hope everyone's staying safe out there, and I will see you tomorrow for Nick Dwyer and the 10th inning.